I thought I'd talk about Watson gnats. And that's not as in the small insect, but N-A-T-S. N-A-T-S and W-A-T-S. All right. You're going to tell me what it stands for? You're going to keep me in suspense. <laughs> so they're both acronyms. NAT stands for narrow angle tail sources and WATS stands for wide angle tail sources. They're both kinds of radio galaxies. I think we made a video some time ago talking about radio jets and talking about the fact that when you look in, in the radio part of the spectrum at some galaxies, you find these enormous jets coming out of them. And they're associated with a black hole in the middle and the black hole is throwing out material in, in very energetic form to produce these enormous jets of radio emission. It's this stuff called synchrotron emission, which is just electrons and other charged particles orbiting around the magnetic fields out there and emitting radio waves as they do it. The watts and the nats are like that, except they're bent. Let me show you a picture. So here's a picture right. of both a watt and a nat. Okay. So that's the watt. It's wide, it's, it's bent quite gently, and that's the gnat, it's bent enormously. So these are contour plots, we're just basically telling you where the radio emission is. So looking at the gnat, there's the galaxy at the top, and then the radio jets are bent right back. Right. And in a watt, they're just, they're just bent a little more gently in a watt than in a gnat. Okay, so that's what you were talking about first, and then that's yep. a watt, and that's like a yep. gnat. And watts tend to be more kind of U-shaped and gnats tend to be a bit more kind of V-shaped as well as being kind of steeper. They're just different extremes of the same kind of thing, but astronomers like coming up with classifications for things and so they end up classifying them as different. Okay. Uh, but they're probably the same kind of object. That's just, that's just going to start a whole argument about when a watt becomes a gnat. <laughs> exactly. And, and, you know, it's not a well-defined thing. And you, and, you know, you can start trying to think up, well, why would the jet not be straight. And one thing that could be happening is perhaps the black hole in the middle or the structure around the black hole in the middle is getting kind of kicked around, right? And so, for example, if two galaxies have merged or if something had just caused its inside to kind of wobble around a bit. But that doesn't do it, right? Because that would actually make the, the two ends go the same way. Hmm. And so even if it was kind of doing different things at different times, you might end up with something S-shaped that way in that the jets were initially shooting that way and then they were shooting that way. And when you sketch them together, you end up with an S or a Z, but hmm. you'll never end up with a U-shape. And so it, it can't be anything internal to the galaxy. It's something which is picking out a particular direction external to the galaxy. There are a couple of forces that could be responsible for bending the jets. Probably the most important of the two is ram pressure. That this is a galaxy which is traveling through some cluster or other, and that cluster has its own diffuse gas in it. And what's happening is these jets are smacking into that and getting pushed back by it. And then becoming like flumes off the back of a Formula One car exactly. or something. So that's probably what's responsible of it. And that's kind of interesting in itself, right? Because that tells you what direction this galaxy is traveling in. Hmm. Right, usually we can't tell. You know, we can usually measure line of sight speeds of galaxies because we can measure Doppler shifts in spectra and things. But we don't usually know on the plane of the sky what way this galaxy is going. But if, if this picture is right, this galaxy is clearly heading up this way. Hmm. So it tells us immediately something about the motions of the galaxy on the sky as well as the fact that it's travelling through a medium and so on. The second force is buoyancy. It turns out that these jets that are coming out are actually less dense than their surroundings. So the material inside the radio jet is almost a, a pure vacuum in there. It's much lower density than the material around. And when you've got material of low density inside material of high density, gravity works the opposite way around, right? That actually things float. Right? The, way, the, the reason why a ball, if you push a ball under, underwater, it comes back up to the surface again is because it's less dense than the water. So instead of being pulled down by gravity, it's actually pushed up. So the other force that's almost certainly at play here is that actually the, these things tend to float away from the centre. If they're sitting in a cluster with a pull of gravity and the cluster pulling them one way, the, the radio jets will tend to float away the other way. And that's probably what's happening in this case, in this because you see in this, in this galaxy here, the jet bends first one way and then the other way. And almost certainly what's happening there is this galaxy is moving off in this direction, so there's ram pressure bending it that way. But eventually the buoyancy force becomes the more important force and it actually starts to float away from the centre of the cluster. So it bends off in a different direction. This jet, the leftover jet, that has now left its parent galaxy, is floating obviously in the medium between galaxies in the cluster. Mm. And it's dense enough and it's got enough stuff in it that we can like see it. And yet you're telling me it's less dense than just the empty space between the galaxies. Absolutely. Because you don't need very much, you know, in that jet, you just need there to be enough electrons and things whizzing around to produce these radio waves. So you yeah. don't need a whole lot of stuff. And I always think of the space between galaxies as being close to as undenser places you can get. And yet this stuff's even less dense. 
Absolutely, yeah. No, it really, it really is, and to the point where it's probably a much better vacuum. Although bear in mind that actually, you know, clusters of galaxies, you know, they're a pretty good vacuum, but actually there's much more stuff, there's much more gas held in that potential well than there is in, you know, away from that cluster of galaxies in really deep space. So although they're a very good vacuum, there is actually a fair amount of, of material still in them, of gas still in them, which we can see, you know, that gas that surrounds the cluster, that fills the cluster, gets very hot. It's all orbiting around very quickly. It's smashing into other bits of the gas and so on. We can see that gas directly by looking at the X-ray emission from the cluster. If you look at one of the relatively nearby clusters, the Perseus cluster, you can see there's been loads of interactions where the central radio source has effectively blown a whole load of bubbles in different directions at different times. So there's a very complicated story going on. That gas that's in the cluster isn't just sitting there necessarily. You know, if clusters are crashed into each other and so on, that gas will get stirred around as well. So there's actually weather going on in that gas that there's flows within that gas, which can complicate the picture as well. It's such big picture stuff, isn't it? This is stuff that's all happening over such timescales and such mind-blowing it, it distances. There's one final cute thing to say about this, which is if we go back to that example I was looking at before, this is a, a, class, the, a radio source I studied with a PhD student, what about, blimey, 30 years ago now. One of the problems is you want to figure out, okay, so how much RAM pressure is there, right? Which means basically how fast is this galaxy traveling in this direction to produce this RAM pressure? And the answer is you can't really tell because the amount the jet gets bent depends on how fast the material is traveling along the jet right, because effectively you're kind of diverting the jet. So if the material's flowing along really quickly along that jet, then a little bit of diversion is not going to make it bend very much. Whereas if it's traveling relatively slowly, a little bit of pushing it this way will actually make it bend a lot. So you, there's sort of this unknown in there that we can't actually tell how fast this galaxy is moving because we don't know how fast the jet's moving. But the cute part is, okay, here the ram pressure that's bending it is the dominant force. Here the buoyancy is the dominant force. At uh, just this point in between, those two forces balance each other out. They're exactly equal to each other. It's neither bending downwards nor upwards. It's, it's straight there. So the buoyancy force is equal to the ram pressure force. Putting that extra piece of information in, and um, we can actually calculate the buoyancy force fairly directly because we know how much gas there is there and we can see how much it's bending. So we can actually figure out things more about the buoyancy force. That's enough to remove that remaining ambiguity. So we can actually really say how fast this galaxy is traveling. And it works out it's traveling a few hundred kilometers per second. Typically, velocities within a cluster of galaxies can be thousands of kilometers per second. So it's going, you know, at a relatively modest speed. And then once we solve that, we can put that back into all the equations again and say, OK, so how fast does that mean the material must be traveling along the jet to create this bend in this inner part? And the answer there is a few thousand kilometers per second, which is also interesting in that it's not hugely fast, right? People think about material getting flung out from these centers of these galaxies at relativistic speeds. It's not relativistic speeds. So by the time it's out here, it's slowed down significantly. It's still only a few thousand kilometers per second, but it's still a lot faster than the galaxy itself is moving. Professor, whenever I've seen visualizations of these jets coming out of center of galaxies, they always look like these incredibly powerful, violent, like lasers or something that you wouldn't want to get hit by. But now you've portrayed them with these incredibly diffuse areas if i was in a spacesuit out in in you know and was sitting in one of these things would i even know i was in it so if you were very close to the black hole in these jets you'd know all about it because there's gamma rays and x-rays and all sorts of energetic particles and things by the time you're out of these very large distances there are still quite fast moving particles and there must be in order to produce to be producing this radiation but it's very diffuse right this, as, as we've just seen right the density is incredibly low so i think probably my recommendation is not to try it but it's nowhere near as kind of lethal an environment out there as it is much closer to the black hole because it's so much dimmer than all the other galaxies in the cluster and also it's recessional velocity so you know the the universe is expanding right so all the galaxies are moving away from us you expect um, galaxies in the same cluster to move away from us at the same rate 